happy Sabbath to everyone. And uh, our message this morning is the the results of the union of church and state. And of course, um, this is something, a topic that I've been looking at for a while now of the subject of religious liberty. And uh, I think that's very important. We'll be looking at uh, some principles there, somewhat a review, but we want to look at the, the consequences of this deadly union. Um, and of course, we have to remember that in the time of Israel, there was an actual theocracy that would certainly have not been deadly. In fact, the opposite was, was deadly. But what we're talking about here is when there actually was a separation of those two powers that God put in place. So if we uh, turn our Bibles to John chapter 18 and verse 36, it says there, And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. I want, I want us to look very carefully at this. It says, my kingdom is not of this world. What, what, what does that imply? That's right. The heavenly kingdom. And it says there, then would my servants fight. Um, and you look at the kingdoms of the world and what they always do. They fight all the time. It's a conquest of resources, of land or food or wealth. Uh, Babylon came within the gates of Israel, and and the king showed them all that he had. And what did he do? He just did that. He didn't show them, well, this is where this came from, that God gave us these things. And so Babylon came back to take those things because they had nothing to fear. The, the king was supposed to be... Um, sharing the gospel, sharing the good news of God, and you know the in the in the test the Old Testament in the scriptures, what was the king? What the Hebrew word, Messiah? He was the anointed of Israel, and of course, he was not the promised Messiah, but he was to direct people. He had a spiritual responsibility, not as much in some ways as the priest, but he certainly had to control affairs and direct people's minds to who, who was in charge, that he followed God. And that was there was a division. Originally, there was no king in Israel, but then they wanted to be like the other nations, like the world. And so God maintained a separation. The king could not go into, into the sanctuary and perform the actions of the, the priest. And of course, when we read this, it should direct our minds to some familiar scriptures. For instance, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. And there's no slide for this, but it says, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And, and so what is in the world? You know, the men vying for power for worldly gain. Um, it was said of, of Cain that he went and builded him a city and he dwelt among his earthly possessions. This is actually, we're going to see that this is a contrast that goes against the people of God. Also in John 15, verse 19, it says, If he um, were of the world, the world would <clears throat> love his own. But what? The world hates you. But if you have a so-called theocratic government and the world just loves it, there's something wrong. If we go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, we continue reading here about the kingdoms of the world. 
<clears throat> and of course, these kingdoms again are ruled by men. It says, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Again, the wording there, it says the kingdoms of this world. But of course, it's talking there about a time when, when Christ regains the world. That, has that happened yet? No. Matthew 19, 6. Matthew 19, 6. It says, therefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore... God is joined together, let no man put asunder. And, and so, what is this talking about? Marriage. Yeah, that's the, the institution of marriage. And so, um, if God puts two people together, they're not to be divided. What if God separates two, two things? Are they to be put together? No. So if the if this is true then the opposite must be true as well. In Matthew chapter twenty two and verse twenty um verse nineteen we're gonna start there. This but it says there in Matthew chapter twenty two and verse nineteen, show me the tribute money, and they brought unto him a penny. In verse twenty, and he said unto them, Whose is this image in superscription? And this is Christ talking to those who are tempting him. And then continuing on to verse 21, it says, And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And so we see here Christ is making a distinction, a separation between the church and the state. There are things that pertain to God and things that pertain to Caesar. But if they're united, if there's confusion in this, then it must be an illicit relationship, right? That there's something corrupt going on. Unless it's by God's design. 54 verse 5, it says, For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. The whole earth. Of course, Satan is a usurper, but you notice there in that verse that God, or maker, is the husband. He's Israel's husband. He's our husband, the church's husband. And we see that imagery repeated in, in the New Testament. God wants us to be united in a, in a marriage with him. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them saith the Lord. And so Israel, unfortunately, had a habit of breaking that. In 2 Corinthians verse 11, uh, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, it says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So that's in the New Testament. <clears throat> um, so you know, there's a there's a very serious point here when it comes to this marriage being espoused uh, to a husband. And it deals with that commitment. Um, 
Today we look at the world and we see people marrying and divorcing and remarrying or having open marriages and triple and quadruple marriages and, you know, things that really pervert this institution that we, it's a religious institution called marriage. If we go to Romans chapter uh, 7 and verse 2, it says, Therefore the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. So the law says that they are bound together. And um, <clears throat> how long? How long were they to be together? That's right, until death. And Jesus, is Jesus dead? No. So in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, there's no slide for this verse. It says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So here we see that that Christ is not dead, but continues to live. Uh, so, so this is not to be broken, by certainly by Christ. If it were to be broken, it would be by us illegitimately breaking it off. In the, uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 3, it says, So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress, but if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Again, this is from the New Testament, from chapter 7 of Romans. This is reiterating the law that was written in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch. So, Christ is alive, and of course, the woman represents the church. So if the church goes off to be with another man, what has she done? She's committed adultery. She has committed an illicit act. In, in the uh, Bible, the word for illicit actually is, is uh, pornea, which, which means it, it, we, we interpret that as fornication. So adultery is a, f a form of fornication. Going to Revelation chapter 17, verse 1, it says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And so here um, we know that when we study the Bible, this is talking about the symbology is of a church. And it sits upon many waters, which represents many people, tongues, uh, nations, <clears throat> and has committed adultery because it says there that it's a whore. And that, that word there refers to, to lust, to lust after. And continuing on to the next verse. In Revelation 17 and verse 2, it says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been drunk, excuse me, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So who, if, uh, if this is a church, who is she fornicating with again? The kings of the earth. How has this woman fornicated with the kings of the earth? And um, going on to verse 5, it says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And so this is of a very particular spirit, a spirit of wickedness, of you know, God is the, the revealer of mysteries, and yet this is from the spirit of one who would keep things my mysterious and, and secret. It's certainly not of God, what's being described here. In Revelation chapter 18, verses 
uh, 1 through 3. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having, a, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and, and the cage of every unclean, hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich to the abundance of her delicacies. Uh, going back um, in that verse, we see these different things mentioned. The habitation of devils and the f hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean, hateful bird. This is talking about the spiritual corruption of this church that's being mentioned here. Now, as Adventists, you know, we know that this is talking about um, Catholicism, but can this be applied to those who follow after Catholicism, the same spirit? Well, actually, it's not just talking about Catholicism. In fact, I believe in this chapter, it's actually probably being focused more towards apostate Protestantism. And so that, that I think, is the emphasis there. That's something that we need to be aware of because this is a spiritual condition and we don't want to be in it ourselves. We don't have want to have that mindset. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, and we're going to deal here with, with the, the spiritual power of God. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, <clears throat> for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we're talking here about what is the power of God? It says, unto salvation. And of course, that what does that involve? What is the gospel? That Jesus is the Son of God. God, God came, the Son of God came and died, mm -hmm. so we didn't have to. But to maintain salvation, we have to, we have to continue in the work that's continually being done. You have the two two forms of justification, or of uh, sanctific um, of Christ's righteousness being brought to us. We're we're covered by His Christ's righteousness, but we're also imputed His righteousness. That that involves power from God and working in our lives through this through God's Spirit. Going on to. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1, it says, And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, so he was 99, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Is that impossible? That's right. But if we go about trying to do it ourselves, we will fail. But God... Through God, all things are possible. This is the power of God unto salvation. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 26, it says, Lift up your eyes on high. Behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them by their names, by the greatness of his might, for he is strong in power, not one faileth. So this is talking about God's creative power. He has the power to create the worlds, to create the stars. Going on to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Do we believe that? So here's a question. It says, of what do men confess their ignorance 
when they appeal to the power of the state to assist in gospel work. What, what are men confessing? I put a little verse underneath there. It's sort of like a cheat, I guess you could say. That there's a if this was a test. It says in Ezekiel thirty six twenty six, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. That's what's being denied by people who deny the gospel, who deny the power of God because they do things in their own power. They have made themselves antichrists. In Matthew 22 and verse 29, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. What is God able to do? That's right, all things. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1, um, 1 through 5, <clears throat> says, This know also that in the last days perilous, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce, truce breakers, false accusers. This, this is one that I see all the time. Everywhere you'll see it in the news, you'll see it on on YouTube, you'll see it um, um, on blogs and newspapers. Uh, you know, when when we study what what gossip is, and we look at many of these news articles, a lot of it's just uh, gossip. It, it's busybodies. Um, where's the evidence? You, you see people on the news say, "Well, we have a you know a, a silent source." Well, I'm sorry, but if you really want me to believe what you're saying, I need proof. Because if there is no proof, I'll become guilty. I don't want to become guilty because the Bible talks about evil surmising. And it continues on. It says, um, in, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. We see that all the time as well. Uh, the Bible says, uh, Woe well unto them that call good evil and evil good, who uh, put darkness in the place of light. Traitors. We see that all the time. Um, these people that allow uh, these foreign um, bodies of people, these, these groups of people that come up from our southern border, um, and that's kind of political, sure, but it's being done for a purpose. History is repeating itself. When we look at how the first Rome fell, it was because there was a surge of people that watered down the, uh, the principles upon which their nation, their, you know, Rome was more than just a place. It was, it was a state of mind. It was an idea. But if you can destroy that idea, you can conquer them. And this was something that Hannibal learned when he was fighting against Rome. But of course, there are people that probably learned to counter that, and it's being used today in our society. Uh, these people are traitors. There's also people that are heady, high-minded, lovers, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Um, you know, that people that are heady and high-minded. You see people that are called before councils and courts and things, and and they're being very, uh, they're spoken to very politely by those who are asking them questions, uh, asking for their witness. And they'll say, Madam, Sir, and what response do they give to those people? You will call me doctor. You will call me professor. They act offended, like like that somehow they were mislabeled. You know, that's self flattery. That's um, so puffed up. It never used to be that way. 
I mean, it's, to some extent, it used to be, but we're seeing this being concentrated, uh, you know, in the writings of Paul here to Timothy. We're seeing corruption. And we, we looked at there before at this other, uh, let me see here. Disobedient to parents. Uh, if you were that way, even among the heathen a thousand years ago, they would have cast you out from your home if not put you to death. Uh, there's a, a quote here that I have. Um, let me see here. This comes from Dr. John Moore. The utmost severity can do is to make men hypocrites. It can never make them converts. So what it's saying here is when, when a nation decides to, to, to combine the church and the state, and they say, well, you have to come into the church and you have to do these things. What happens if you don't believe those things? If you, if you come into the church and you put on a show, you're a hypocrite. And a hypocrite isn't just one, you know, we, in our society, we, we define that as one who says but doesn't do. It, actually, the word for actor in the Greek is hypocrite. That's where the word, um, hip, uh, I, I don't remember exactly how you pronounce the Greek word, but it's putting on a show, in, an act for everyone to see. This is what Christ accused the Pharisees of doing. They were putting on a show, said that they won't even, they won't even, do the things that they tell you to do. And so what it's talking about here is when you create this false system, this false dichotomy, it is false because people, there are so many people that won't believe it. And uh, historically, there's instances where this came back to um, create problems. Um, um, the Jews, historically, there was an incident where they they uh, forced the, uh, a group of Edomites, uh, I don't remember the, 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 the year that this happened, but they forced them to convert. But this just put the enemy inside their own camp. Going on to uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began, excuse me, he began to say unto his dis disciples, first of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is what? Hypocrisy. They have so many laws. When, when you first woke up in the morning and you turned to get out of bed, they said, put on your right shoe, but don't tie it, and then put on your left shoe. And then go back and tie your right shoe, and then go and tie your left shoe. That was, how, you know, everything that dealt with your entire day, they had some old tradition to, to control. Yeah, it does sound like OCD, but um, but remember, these people were afraid of the, the nation falling back into, into uh, the judgment of God. But what they do, they created their own laws that completely did that. It brought the nation into judgment again. And especially, what did they do? It led them to condemn their own Messiah. He was there among them and they didn't, they perceived him not. In Romans chapter 14, verse 23, it says, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so, you can't be covered by hypocrisy. It won't save you. If anything, it'll make you even worse a sinner. In the book of Daniel, chapter 3 and verse 15, 
Daniel 3.15, it says, Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver thee out of my hands? This was the command given to, given to all the people in the land of, of um, surrounding the, the image there in Babylon. And of course we know that story. There were three worthies who refused. And Daniel probably was elsewhere in the kingdom. What is this? It's action. It's force. It's, it's a punishment for not obeying the religious law. And quite commonly, these nations in the past mixed their religion with their government. There was a national national religion. Um, I'm sorry, this, this slide, I'm going to the next slide, but this uh, Johnny Appleseed is just the, the fake name that um, Keynote puts in when you're supposed to fill in. There, there's no, I have no reference to where this quote comes from. I'm not really sure where it comes from. So just Johnny Appleseed, that's sort of like John Doe or John Smith. It says, faith cannot be forced Neither can the conscience be guided or controlled by an appeal to arms. A any attempt, therefore, to compel men to have the courage of their convictions to do differently from what they believe must necessarily result in persecution. It cannot result otherwise. It's you know it's kind of, it's kind of like children, you know they don't they don't believe they should make their bed. But what happens if they disobey you? Punishment. Now, of course, that, that's an ordained system. God set up the household government. But what happens if someone outside your household tries to force you to obey a religion? Well, it's illicit. It's an re illicit relationship. Now, what about civil government? What happens if you go next door and... You grab your neighbor and throw her into a pit. Is there a punishment for that? Yeah, because uh, you've just acted against your neighbor. That doesn't have to do with religion, although, yeah, there's, there's a moral aspect to it. But civil government is there to enforce civil law. You, you can't have c civility... You can't have stability or any of those things if people are allowed to hurt each other and there be no consequences. Moving on to the next slide. In John 19 and verse, verses 14 and 15, <clears throat> John 19, 14 and 15, it says, And it was the preparation of the Passover... And about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. This is, of course, Pilate talking. But they cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And this is pointing to the spiritual depravity where you are so willing to put your faith into civil government to enforce religion, do you, you would actually uphold that civil government as if it were God himself. And uh, there, there was a religious uh, group, I don't remember what, what it was called, they, they were the ones who had the title of um, Ma Pontifex Maximus. And when the time of the Caesars came around, they absorbed that into, into their imperial ranks as emperor. And so Caesar became a religious figure, um, as it were, God 
God on earth. So when they say this about Caesar, it's very, very disturbing and corrupt. But how did they get to this point? It's because they denied God. They, they put their, their faith and trust in man rather than God. And what was the consequence of, of all these actions, this decline in Israel? In Matthew 23, verse 38, and this is also from chapter 21, verse 43, it says, Behold, your, left, your house is left unto you desolate. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And so their, their, their temple certainly was left. That's why he's referring to your house is left unto you desolate. God was not there even before uh, Christ paid that price. But, you know, you know, their hearts were left desolate. Truly. <clears throat> Going on to Luke chapter 19, verse 41, it says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee and on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground. And thy children within thee, they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visit visitation. This was judgment. God had left, and, and eventually, um, uh, there, there was actually wrath. Uh, you know, we read in Revelation, the nations have become angry. Well, if you read the historical events, they're describing the great controversy. Those people that went into Jerusalem, they were angry at, at the Hebrew, the Jews there, because they had uh, fought against them. And of course, what, what should they have done? If this was a judgment, they should have surrendered, submitted themselves to that judgment, but they didn't. There was not one Christian that perished in that city in Jerusalem when it was destroyed in AD 70 because they obeyed the command of Christ to leave. Samuel uh, T. Spear once said, when religion and civil government are legally united, neither derives any benefit from the union. Both are seriously damaged by it. The most characteristic feature of such a union is that of a bad religion and a bad government at the same time, each being harmed by the other. You know, the, the, the depths of moral de degradation that, that occur, the compromise. You know, God told the, the Hebrews, you know, don't go over and marry the Canaanites. But the, the moment that, um, you know, what about the, the other laws and things? Well, if they compromised by going over and uniting with an ungodly woman or ungodly man, you've already compromised, so what's to stop you from worshiping their gods? So, you know, if you despise your neighbor because he keeps the Sabbath better than you or keeps a different Sabbath and you decide to, to force them, what's to stop you from going on progressively? But of course, we, it doesn't even have to start there. It's already started where people become involved with the government and they, they want the government to give them exemptions from, uh, for instance, having to work a job where you transport alcohol because you, you, you want to say, well, I don't want to transport that without being fired, and you go to the government. You know, shouldn't you be praying to God to, for a job that will not um, disturb your conscience, but instead there are people who have gone to the government instead of turning to God. 
one thing leads to the next thing. Uh, Dr. Philip Schaff said, Secular power has proved a satanic gift to the church, and ecclesiastical power has proved an engine of tyranny in the hands of the state. So in other words, either, you know, a country has enemies, right? You, you look at China, you look at Russia, you look at North Korea. Uh, for any reason, these, these countries could attack us. But what happens when you start becoming um, what someone a long time ago I, uh, called secular Puritans? What happens when the government adopts Puritanism and becomes a moral government instead of a secular government? Well, the enemy is everywhere. The enemy is inside the confines of your government, in the confines of your borders. And so and so, you know, call, you know, they were talking about how you should be healthy. Oh, well, that's that's hate against fat people. Oh, oh, use the word fat. That's hate. What is hate, and what right does the government have to say that you are not allowed to have it? But you see that in the language, people talk about hate speech. Show me a crime that was not done, that, that was done in love and not hate. That's a good test. And in cl closing here, um, in Hebrew, this isn't on the slide, but in Hebrews chapter 11, it says this in verse 13. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So what were they looking for? They were looking for something that wasn't here, that they they weren't really citizens of this world. Their citizenship was somewhere else. They had faith in something, not of this world. At verse 16, it says, But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. <clears throat> And that city is New Jerusalem. And that's where our citizenship is. Not in this world. Unfortunately, there are people who have made their homes here. And that can be a struggle because the world is very enticing. The spirit of Cain, the spirit of the antediluvians to, to constantly beautify their homes. But those are those homes really supposed to be permanent? Uh, and, and I'm not saying that there's anything against building with steel and wood and cement and vinyl. It's it's really your mindset. Is is this in your mind where you intend to spend the rest of your existence? Well, we know that's not true because after after death, what comes next? The judgment. But do you want to be judged righteous or unrighteous? Which resurrection will you be brought up in? And these are the things that we need to consider. But especially those who would bring about this, this union, this adulterous relationship between church and state, they are uniting that which is secular with that which is, that which is profane with that which is, which is holy in such a way that they're committing hatred and murder against their brethren and God would have us love and pray for those who disagree and despise us whether they're in our same denomination or religion or if they live in another country or not so thank you for